it's time to play some toss. Welcome everyone to another edition of Tristan on Sports Show. It's your friendly neighborhood T-Squared. Tristan Thomas here with you for yet another episode of Truthful, Opinionated, and Passionate Sports Talk. This is what we do each and every single Wednesday. Thank y'all for joining us. We're glad to be here. Glad you guys are with us. And let's jump right into State of the State. Let's get down to that Packer game on Sunday. The Packers beat the St. Louis Rams on Sunday. It was a hard-fought win. It was a hard-fought win. It was a win that I knew would be very uh, difficult because you look at what the St. Louis Rams bring to the table. They bring a defense. They bring a defense. I knew they were going to make life a little bit hell. They were going to bring a little bit of hell to the Green Bay Packers up at Lambeau. The game was going to be a lot tougher than uh, many people thought. And, uh, hey, you saw that. Um, The joke is that Aaron Rodgers is human. (laughs) At least that's what Mike McCarthy said. I believe that's what he said, Um, which we all knew. You know, he's been playing out of his gourd. He's been playing at a high level uh, all year. You're bound to have these uh, these types of games, especially against uh, 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 against good defenses. Uh, two picks, a lost fumble. Uh, you're not used to seeing Aaron Rodgers uh, turn the ball over three times uh, ever, uh, much less in one game, really. So it was a little bit different. It was a little bit of a shock for everyone. Um, I think a lot of people were thinking that the St. Louis Rams would just come up to Lambeau and, uh, and roll over and and let Green Bay just roll up 45-plus points on them. And I knew that's not the way they play. Any Jeff Fisher coached team, as the St. Louis Rams are, are going to put up a fight. And that's what they did. Uh, but as good as the Rams' defense was, the Packers' defense was that much better. And we'll get to them in a little bit. I want to talk about the quote-unquote offensive struggles in the past two weeks. And I can't really say that they're offensive struggles. I don't want to go that far. I'm not going to say that the offense is is struggling, even though I think Aaron Rodgers did come out and say that they, they were struggling. I, I think it's just a matter of them coming up against two, two good defenses. Now, people are going to laugh at me when I say the past two weeks they faced good defenses because one of the teams that they just beat over the last couple of weeks is San Francisco. But San Francisco this year so far has risen their play to the level of their competition, at least from what I've noticed. Um, They played very well in week one, beat the Vikings, Monday Night Football. We all saw what they were able to do defensively and with their running game. They rolled those boys up. Uh, We we were able to see what they did uh, against... uh, other teams, I mean, yeah, they've had their ups, they have their downs. They had an absolutely awful game, <laughs> an awful game uh, against the Cardinals. Uh, you know, so they've been a bit of an enigma, but they brought a defense. And that, that defense really played well against Green Bay. And then again, we come back to this week. St. Louis brings a defense. One of the better fronts that they'll face all year long. And they brought it to the Packers. They brought it to them. They were able to turn Aaron Rodgers over. They made life very, very difficult. James Jones had two catches, 77 yards and a touchdown. It, uh, it, let's talk about that touchdown. What a hell of a play. The amount of athleticism and flexibility and, and, and everything that body control, everything strength, everything that goes into that play is amazing. The things that this guy is doing is amazing. How can the Raiders justify cutting this guy? How can the Giants, whose receiving core is truly banged up right now, Odell Beckham's got a bad hamstring, Ruben Randall's got a bad hamstring, Victor Cruz just can't get healthy. I mean, their their receiving core is in shambles right now. And they let him go. So... (laughs) What can you say? I mean, it's it, it was, I guess you could say destiny, I guess. Now, I mean, you don't want to see your number one go down, one of the better receivers in all of the NFL and Jordy Nelson go down. I'm not saying you want to see that. But if this situation were to happen, thank goodness that James Jones was available, because where would this offense be without him? 
Where would they be without him? They'd be supremely struggling. Supremely. Without a doubt. But overall, uh, Eddie Lacy, as we get back to this offense, Eddie Lacy did not run the ball well at all. And I don't know what it is because I can't really say it's the ankle injury. Because they said that was pretty minor, you know, sprained ankle. You know, you, you deal with a little bit of pain depending on the grade that it's sprained at. Uh, luckily, he avoided a high ankle sprain, but unlike Devontae Adams, who's still out with that. But you can't really call it the, the ankle, ankle injury because he ran pretty well last week. I think, what did he have, 80, 90 yards rushing? I mean, that's a pretty decent day on 18 carries, I believe, last week. This week, you got 13 for, I think, 37. I mean that's that's not getting it done. You're five and zero, but you're five and zero, and you haven't really run the ball like we've been accustomed to them running the ball the past couple of seasons with Eddie Lacy being the bell cow back there. I don't want to say it's cause for concern just yet because last year he also got off to a slow start, but as the temperature changes. Your style of play kind of changes. You have to go and be able to play defense and run that football, and especially in the playoffs. And that's where you see Eddie Lacy do his best work when it gets to the midpoint of that season. They start feeding him the rock more, and you start seeing the results. So I'm not ready to push the panic button on the run game on Eddie Lacy quite yet, but it's something to monitor. You know, I think they need to get him a little bit more involved. Uh, again, yeah, we know he's had the ankle injury. James Starks has filled in admirably, uh, ran pretty well. But overall, they haven't really run the football uh, the way that we're accustomed to seeing them run the football. Um, and, and you see Aaron Rodgers is getting out. He's scrambling. Like I said, the last couple of weeks, they just face a, a, a couple of good defenses. A couple of good defenses. And what can you say? They made life tough for those guys. Not the greatest day for Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, 19-30, 241. A couple of touchdowns again. A couple of picks and a lost fumble. Uh, a, a good defensive front is going to do that to you. They're going to make life very, very difficult for you. And that's what they did. But despite all of that, despite the offensive struggles, the defense saved the day. The defense came to play yet again. Dennis Krause, five-time Wisconsin Sportscaster of the Year, a guy who I'm looking forward to doing the roundtable with again very, very soon, uh, said in his blog this week that this this defense of the Green Bay Packers is quote-unquote championship caliber. And I agree. You guys can go and read his blog at Time Water Cable Sports Channel, Wisconsin. Go and read his blog. Because everything that Dennis Krause said on that blog from this week is exactly everything I've been saying on Toss pretty much since the first episode. And now we're on the sixth. You give Dom Capers the proper talent, he will give you a good defense. And that is what Green Bay has been able to do. They they put the right players in the right spots. Look, nobody, who, raise a show of hands of everybody who thought that Demarius Randall and Quentin Rollins, who had two picks, including pick six, would be an immediate impact. Now, those in the know kind of figured that they would be uh, in the rotation. They would be um, playing, but they didn't know what they would get out of those guys. They knew they would have a say, but they didn't know they, how big of an impact they would have. And they're having a huge impact. They're having a huge impact. I can't say enough about how proud I am of those guys. They're really playing. They're they're flying all around the field, and they're going out there. They're making plays. Sam Shields is showing why he is the number one corner in Green Bay. He's continuing to go out there and make plays. I love the way he's playing this year. He's playing with more technique. He's not just purely using his speed because, again, he's one of the fastest men in the NFL. You've seen a lot of him just getting burned, using the speed to make it back up, and then making a play at the last second. This year, you've seen a little bit of that, but you've seen a lot more technique out of him, which I am excited about because once he gets it up here mentally, once he gets it down fundamentally, man, you're talking about a possible lockdown corner. You really could say that. If he gets that technique, if he plays a little bit more technique, he can absolutely be that shutdown corner. Absolutely. But the thing is, if those guys, Quentin Rollins, Demarius Randall, 
continue to play like that. Micah Hyde's out there. He's making plays, as always. Uh, you know, if Casey Hayward can stay healthy, get back to his playmaking ways. I mean, man, you're talking about one of the better secondaries in the NFL. The rushing defense. Now, people are going to say, oh, you man, you've been gushing over this rush defense. You've been gushing over B.J. Raji's return and how well he's been playing over the past few weeks and, and all that. What can you say about him this week? Because Todd Gurley ran up 159 yards on him. Well, Todd Gurley's going to run up 100-plus, 200-plus yards on a lot of teams. The guy is good. The rookie is legit. And I think we all saw that. But, you know, he didn't really get going until after B.J. Raji was injured. B.J. Raji was dealing with a groin injury. Once he left, that run defense kind of suffered. Started opening up holes, their offensive line did. They started finding holes. They started starting to make plays with the running game. And it's it's a little bit of a cause for concern because if B.J. Raji you know, misses any significant time. You guys need to go and pick it up because seeing what you did without them, that that's a cause for concern. They weren't able to stop any of their running backs, but it was mostly Tiger. Like I said, the rookie is good. The guy is legit. I think we all see that. We see why the Rams drafted him, why they were so excited to have him back off of that injury. He's legit, but it makes you a little bit nervous that if, if B.J. Raji goes down and he's missing significant time, how is that run defense going to make up for that? How are they going to play? Because they did not play well after he left the game at all, but the secondary was there. Uh, obviously, the, the, uh, the pass rush was there. Guys are still flying around the field. They, they were still a swarming defense. Still very, very good defensively. I mean, you can't really complain. You can't really complain. They won 24 to 10. This defense gave up 10 points this week. They gave up three points last week. That's an average of 6.5 points per game over the last two games. That is what you want out of your defense. If you're going to say, if you're going to tell me that you're going to only give up six and a half points, but essentially a touchdown a game. And I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get us 28 points a game. I'm going to say you're going to win a lot of games. I'll take that formula. I'll take that recipe. So you get a little bit nervous about BJ Rush not being there. Uh, but the thing is, they weren't really able to punch it in with their run game. It was a bend but don't break type of thing. Gurley got a lot of yardage. He got a lot of yardage. But he did not punch it in. So it's kind of a bend but don't break mentality with, and that's always kind of been the mentality with Dom Capers' defense. He'll give you all the exotic blitzes. He'll he'll be a takeaway defense, but teams tend to run up a lot of yardage on him, which is fine as long as you don't score. Hey, just don't let him score. Get all the yardage you want. Just don't let him score, and that's kind of the recipe that you've seen over the past couple of weeks. You see, you see guys have good games. They'll have big games. But the score will be exactly what it was, 24-10, or last week, 17-3. You've got to be encouraged with what they're seeing defensively. It is a championship-caliber defense. It really is. And the last time I could say that about a Green Bay Packers defense, they won a Super Bowl. Second overall in the league defensively, 15.1 points per game given up. That's a recipe for success. They have it. They're finding ways to win despite kind of sluggish offense. But you're encouraged by the fact that they don't care if they went pretty. They don't care if they went ugly. They just want to win. You're 5-0. You got a big test with Phillip Rivers and the San Diego Chargers coming up this Sunday, the late afternoon game. That's a big one. You will be tested especially after those guys just lost on essentially a walk-off touchdown to the Pittsburgh Steelers on Monday Night Football, they're going to want to come in and make a statement at Lambeau Field where no one has been able to win over the last, what is it now, 12 games? Still currently the NFL's longest win streak, home win streak. It's going to be a big test, and I'm hoping those guys are ready for it. I am hoping those guys get into it. And uh, obviously I'm hoping that they go, <laughs> that they go and, and get this W and keep this thing going.
I'm not worried about six and no. I'm worried about one and no. And that one and no needs to come against the San Diego Chargers this Sunday, the late afternoon game for uh, for Sunday. Looking forward to it. It's going to be a really good matchup. They're really going to be tested. I think the secondary is really going to be tested uh, to come this Sunday. So it's going to be a good matchup for those guys. Continuing on with State of the State, let's get into some Bucks basketball. They're still in preseason. They had yet another preseason tip uh, earlier tonight against the Cleveland Cavaliers, the defending Eastern Conference champion, Cleveland Cavaliers. Encouraged by Rashad Vaughn. Encouraged by him. He continues to play well. Continues to play well. I believe he had 19 points tonight. He continues to to progress and show that, hey, maybe he is going to get some time in this rotation. Now, you don't know, you never know who Jason Kidd is going to put in his rotation because ask Chris Middleton <laughs> how, he, how, how he was last season. There was a point in time where Chris Middleton was not even played, not even in a rotation, not even an afterthought. He got his chance and he made the most of it, played extremely well. So, and I know it's preseason, but you still have to be encouraged by the development so far of this guy. He's, he's showing that he's a more than capable NBA scorer. Will he, will he be in that rotation for Jason Kidd once the season begins? Who knows? Jason Kidd does a lot of things. Sometimes they make your head scratch, but more times than not, they work. Very smart guy, very smart head coach, still learning and growing into the position. But I'm definitely encouraged by the Rook. I think so far, so good. I just want to see him continue to progress, uh, continue to be that that scoring threat, continue to to learn to play defense, just continue to progress. That's what we need out of you. We need progression. And I think you're seeing that, especially in this preseason. So good for the Rook. He continues to play very, very well. The Moose, the Moose, Greg Monroe, the Moose among deer. Uh, had a, had a double double, I believe, seventeen points, twelve rebounds. He just doing what he does, he, you know. He's going out there, he's he's cleaning up the glass, and he's getting that inside scoring. That's what we need out of him. We don't need him to be extra special sauce. We don't need him to go out and be out play outside of himself. We need you to do you, do what you always done, and he's doing that. So that is fantastic. But for as much as I'm encouraged by some guys. I am not too enthusiastic about one player in particular, uh, especially after tonight's performance. Again, preseason, but this is this is a habitual offender. Michael Carter Williams, one for eleven from the field. Let me say that again: Michael Carter Williams, one for eleven from the field. Now, I know it's preseason. I know it's preseason. But that is unacceptable. And I say it's unacceptable. And prefacing it by saying, I know it's preseason, but I'm saying it's unacceptable because he is a habitual offender. The guy cannot shoot the ball. If he fell out of a boat, he could not hit water. Okay, he could not throw the ball into Lake Michigan standing on Bradford Beach. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. There's writers out there saying, oh, well, you know what? I don't think Michael Carter Williams needs to learn how to shoot the basketball in order to help this team. What kind of asinine comment is that? How stupid do you sound? Of course you need to be able to shoot the basketball. Are you kidding me? You're not always going to be able to penetrate on every single team. You're not always going to be able to draw a kick. And as it stands right now, I don't think the Bucks really have a whole bunch of shooters that are going to be able to play that draw and kick game. We know what Money Middleton could do. He could shoot the three. Grievous Vasquez is a good three-point shooter. If Rashawn Vaughn continues to progress and gets into that rotation, he'll provide a little bit of shooting. But outside of that, who do you really have? You don't really have that type of personnel to be able to do that. So that that increases his turnover rate, which is another problem with him. He can't shoot the ball. He turns the ball over. But yet he's supposed to be a point guard. I know what you're going to say. He's gotten triple doubles. 
Okay, I got you there. It's fantastic. He's gotten triple doubles. That's great. But fundamentally, the position that you play, you need to be able to shoot the basketball. You need to be able to shoot the basketball. You need to be able to have some type of shot. And a guy who should know that is his head coach, Jason Kidd. Remember when he came in, he couldn't shoot the ball worth a damn. He ended up being one of the better three-point shooters in NBA history. Evolved. Taught himself how to shoot the three. How to shoot the basketball. That's what Michael Carter-Williams needs to do. He needs to learn how to shoot the basketball because that is another way he's going to be able to help this team. The turnovers and the not being able to hit an open shot are going to get you traded from this team. You continue that, it's going to cost this team games. And we can't afford that. Cannot afford that. When I saw that on the stat line, it just made my eyes just pop wide open. Absolutely unacceptable. For a team that's supposed to be learning, for a team that's supposed to be growing. I haven't seen much improvement out of him. And I know he hasn't been here for a full season. I get it. I get it. And I'm trying to be patient. But when you have things going on in your game that is counterproductive to what your team needs you to do. I have a big problem with that. I have a huge problem with that. Hey, it's preseason. I'm hoping it gets better. Hey, I'm hoping he learns. I hope he evolves into that player that everybody thinks he can be. Never root for a guy to fail. I want him to make it. But I don't want him to cost us games. I don't want him to cost us games. And right now, the turnovers, the not being able to shoot the basketball, he's a habitual offender. That's something you cannot afford. You can't afford this. So hopefully he gets in that gym. He continues to work harder on his shooting, work harder on not turning the basketball over, having a a little bit more of a basketball IQ for what's going on, and improve as a player. Show everybody why you were traded for. Go out there and live up to that potential that everybody believes that you have within you. You're young. You still got it in you. I think you can improve. I hope that you do. I just don't want to see your current state cost this team games. Because a missed shot here, a turnover there with a young team, that could fracture your confidence. That could send you into a tailspin that you may not be able to recover from. I think this team, yeah, they're young. They're a little bit more mature with that. But still, you're still young. You have those moments. Can't afford to have something like that happen. You cannot afford to play like that. You cannot afford to continue to be a habitual offender, not being able to make open shots and turning the basketball over. That's not what a good point guard does. So I'm hoping that he gets it together. I think that he can. But I guess we'll see. Continue to improve. It was their first preseason win for the Bucks. Obviously, you like to get the win, but you like to see progression even more. So continue to keep an eye on those guys. Hopefully, we see some growth out of them. I think that's what we're all hoping. We're all rooting for you, man. It's not a slight against you. We just want you to be better. Do better. So we can all be better. That's all I want. No ill will towards you, but you got to tighten that up. That shooting needs to get better. That decision making with the basketball needs to get better. You do that, you'll be the point guard for this team for many years to come. I have no doubts about that because the kid has special talents. He does. But special talents without fundamentals really means you got squat. You ain't got a damn thing. And if you ain't bringing a damn thing to the table, then we don't need you on the team. Plain and simple. I think Jason Kidd will hammer that point home to him. I think it's going to continue to work with him. You know, he seems to be a point guard whisperer. So uh, I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to lay back. I'm going to keep an eye on the, you know, on it. I'm going to hope that Jason Kidd does what he does. And he, and we see improvement out of him. He's got him for a, a full season. Maybe if he continues to play like this, I don't think he's going to survive the rest of the season. I, don't, I really don't. I think he, I think he'll be gone in a trade for someone else. So keep an eye on it. 
see what it does. Hope for growth, you know, hope for more growth. So that's just the state of the state, man. It's, uh, you know, the Packers are, you know, a little bit of a, a struggle on offense. The defense continues to swarm, but they continue to win 5-0. and The Bucks get their first preseason win. Rashad Vaughn continues to grow, continues to evolve. Moose, Greg Monroe, we need you to continue to be you. Michael Carter-Williams, we need you to be a better you. Coming up on Toss, we're going to get into the Toss sweep, and we're going to talk some college football as well as a situation that makes me absolutely sick with the NFL. We'll be right back. Did you know that we're on Facebook? Well, if you don't know, now you know. Facebook.com slash T on Sports Show. That's T-O-N Sports Show. we got a lot of content on there. We also have every single link for every single place you can listen to us on Toss each and every single Wednesday. That's right. Each and every single Wednesday, we got brand new content for you. That's Facebook.com slash T-O-N Sports Show. Give us a like. Check us out. Welcome back to Toss, everybody. Your friendly neighborhood, t Square. Tristan Thomas here with you. And it's time to get into the Toss Sweep. And I'm going to start the Toss Sweep off this week with a little bit of college football. Mainly two end-of-the-spectrum type deals. Both universities being a USC. Let's go to USC East, meaning the University of South Carolina. Head ball coach. Steve Spurrier, not the old ball coach, like a lot of people think it is, it's head ball coach, head ball coach, HBC. Steve Spurrier is calling it a career. He's retiring at age 70. Former Heisman Trophy Award winner uh, led the, the Florida Gators to a 96 national championship, and that's mostly where I remember him from are all those great Florida teams that he put together. A lot of SEC championships. Uh, again, that national championship in 19, uh, I believe it was 1996, I want to say. Uh, that's where I remember him from. Did great work. And, and you have to respect a guy who sees um, that window close. Uh, he really built up South Carolina uh, into a, a contender. They kind of backslid. They kind of backslid. And he saw that and I think he says something along the lines of, you know, I used to be the best job, the best guy at this job 11 years ago, and now I'm not. And and that's a that's a significant uh, take on yourself. That is a a a big statement to make about yourself. That's a big thing to do to realize that, you know, I used to be good at it, I used to have it, but now I just I don't have that touch anymore. It's time to walk away. I just, I don't have that touch anymore. Because you have a lot of guys that stay in it far too long, far past their prime, far past what their football minds can comprehend. And they think that, oh, you know, I have this reputation. You know, I should be winning based on that. And it doesn't work that way. If people wanted their reputations, you know, I mean, I don't want to get into that (laughs) because some people's reputations are better than others. But this game isn't one of your reputation. It's it's one on that field. And he wasn't garnering the results that fit his standard. You know, not the school. The school, the university was was more than willing for him to stay. They, I, I believe they asked him to stay and just to finish out the season. And he just he couldn't do it. I would have liked to see the see him finish the season. I think that's kind of awkward timing, kind of leaving halfway through the season. I don't know if I've ever seen a coach retire, uh, at least a college football coach retire mid-season. Um, so I, I think that's a first for me that I can remember. I'm pretty sure it happened before, but I don't think to a name guy like Steve Spurrier. Yeah, he had really an unsuccessful NFL run. We get that, but we know his heyday, his his work, uh, his mastery was, was, uh, was made in college. So, I mean, man. Cheers to the head ball coach. 
on a hell of a career. Like I said, the guy could play football, Heisman Trophy winner. He could coach football, won a national championship with Florida, rebuilt South Carolina, uh, and now he's stepping away at age 70. And I don't think age had anything to do with it. I just think that, and, and I, I respect this about him, he saw the writing on the wall. I can't do it anymore. I don't have the same effect that I used to have 11 years ago or, or whatever the comment was that he made. He just he felt that he didn't have it. That's a great job of self-reflection and, and, uh, and not having so much ego that you stay in it just because you're a big name in, uh, in, in college sports and in football. Uh, so a lot of respect and, and cheers to the head ball coach, man. Love watching him, all of his his uh his craziness that he used to talk. <laughs> you know, he's he's had some one liners, man. He he's had some lines uh, thrown out there. Uh, I enjoy watching him. I enjoy watching his uh, his his offensive mind, and uh, he's going to be missed, man. He was a he was a great personality, um, a great ambassador uh, of college football, and, and he's definitely going to be missed. He's definitely going to be missed. So cheers to you, head ball coach. I hope you enjoy retirement, even though you said that you don't think you'd be very good at it <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> but I hope you I think anything that you do, you're usually good at, except for that little NFL stint right there. But, you know, it's the Redskins. They're still so tragic right now to this day. So cheers to you, head ball coach. I hope you enjoy retirement and you're definitely going to be missed around the NCAA football circles. Now, let's go to USC West. It's the University of Southern California. It was announced, I believe it was Sunday. I believe it was Sunday. Uh, their head coach, Steve Sarkeesian, uh, would be taking a leave um, of absence because he was ill. And later on, we found out, you know, he's well, not even later on did we find out. We knew he had problems with alcohol. And apparently he at one point took alcohol, and mixed it with uh, prescription drugs or something. He was uh, at a function and he was under the influence, which is never a good thing. So it was announced one day, I believe it was Sunday, that he was going to take a leave of absence. The very next day, I believe it was on Monday, he was fired outright. Gone. Fired outright from, from the position. No longer the head coach at uh, at USC. I don't know the full story, but I think we all know that he had problems with alcohol. Uh, I don't know if the, the problem with prescription drugs is something that's persistent. Um. But we spoke a little bit about alcoholism last week when CC Sabathia came out and said that he was uh, leaving the Yankees uh, before their playoff game to go and get help for his alcoholism. And, you know, a lot of people spewed hate about that. And, you know, I went off about that last week here on Toss. So I'm hoping that he goes and he gets that help. You know, this this hits home for me and it's. It's no laughing matter. It's something very, very serious because he hurts himself. He hurts those around him. He, I mean, you know, you're you're in there. You're trying to coach up, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds to go out there and play hard for you. And you don't even have yourself together. You know, you're trying to motivate them to go out there and be men and be warriors and go out and beat that challenge in front of them. But you haven't been doing so. So I hope that he goes and he gets the help that he needs. You know, I hope he does. I hope he goes and gets the help that he needs and that he gets better. You know, forget football. You know, he, he's he got a family. You know, and I know they all want him to be healthy. And I hope he does go and get that help. And I hope he does go and I hope he does get healthy. He needs it. He needs to. So... You know, Steve, you know, go and do what you got to do, man. Get healthy. Stay sober. You'll see that life is much better that way. Keep on a straight and narrow. And I, I have no doubts that we'll see him uh, somewhere in football circles again. I don't know if he'll be a head coach in college. I don't know if he'll be the head coach in the pros. But as a coordinator or something, I think we'll see him again. I think he's a very talented guy, has a good, a good offensive mind. We will definitely be seeing him again. Sometime, somewhere. But the thing is, he needs to get himself straight first and keep himself straight. And I think that's what we're all hoping for. At least I hope that's what we're all hoping for. If you guys heard the show last week, you know, there's some people out there that are just absolutely disgusting and just wish ill will and don't have their priorities straight. 
So maybe those people don't care. But for me, I care. A lot of people I know, they would care about a situation like this. So I'm hoping that Steve Sarkeesian gets that help. He stays on the straight and narrow. And uh, and I, like I said, I know we'll see him again in some capacity in the game of football. He's far too talented of an offensive guy for him not to be. So I think we'll definitely see him again. So go and get the help. Uh, praying for you, man. Hoping for nothing but good things from here on out for you. Now, on the toss sweep, let's get to the NFL. Now, it's no secret, and all of us NFL fans know this, that the NFL stands for the No Fun League. Because you can't celebrate anymore and, and you know, use the ball as a prop. You can't do that anymore. And if you even wave a towel, you're going to get a taunting flag. And they have these ridiculous uniform rules where they'll find you. Your sock's too low, we'll find you. If you got an extra towel, we'll find you. If you got a towel in a certain spot, we'll find you. If you have a certain... This is, this is the same league that fined Peyton Manning back when he was with the Indianapolis Colts for wearing high-top black spikes, cleats, in honor of Johnny Unitas when Johnny Unitas died earlier that week. You know, Hall of Famer, one of the all-time greats, one of the guys that helped make your league what it is today, that Johnny Unitas. You know, Peyton Manning, going to be in the Hall of Fame probably five minutes after he retires. A guy who's made the league what it is today. Help make the league what it is today. You know, that guy. Yeah. Wants to go and pay tribute to another great as a quarterback position in the NFL. And you find him because he wore high top black cleats. Like, are you kidding me? I remember that. I was absolutely outraged about that. I think I wrote a school report on that. I think <laughs> about how mad I was at that and how ridiculous it was. It was it's just stupid. But nobody sitting here said the NFL was smart. We got another situation just like that. D'Angelo D'Angelo Williams, who was once the Carolina Panthers running back, is now currently the running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Lost his mom to breast cancer. Now, we talk about this story because it's October and that is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. You see pretty much pink everything. The league has pink everything. Pink towels, pink wristbands, pink headbands, pink socks, you know, uh, uh, hoodies with pink. Uh, Everything pink you could think of, the NFL has has it, and they're shilling it. They're calling it a crucial crucial catch. Um, Which, I mean, the the cause is is just. But when D'Angelo Williams wanted to wear... I think it was pink cleats and, uh, and and pink, you know, a lot of pink stuff to bring awareness of breast, uh, you know, to bring awareness of breast cancer awareness and to to honor his mother who lost her life fighting this god awful disease, which took my dad away from me. His second bout with cancer, throat cancer. He lost that battle. I lost countless uncles, countless aunts. And one of my best friends to it. So when he wanted to go and pay tribute to his mother and bring awareness to this. The NFL said no. Nope. Can't do it. And if you do, you're going to be fine at And for every fence after that, it doubles. How, how sickening is that? How disgusting is that? It, 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 it it bothers me. It, it bothers me like no other because you guys could come out with your whole program, a crucial catch. Who knows where the money is going for that? You know, you hear all these reports about the charities and them, most of the money going to pay their CEOs and all this and that. What amount of money is going for breast cancer? Out of all this crucial catch stuff that you get. I get emails from NFL.com and Packers.com about all this crucial catch stuff. You got everything pink. Pink tumblers, uh, uh, pink bumper stickers, pink sweatshirts, pink headbands, pink wristbands, pink jerseys. 
everything you could possibly think of in pink that they're shilling. So if it's the NFL's idea and the NFL can make money off of it, if you do it and you're not sinking any money, you're doing it as a tribute and to bring uh, breast cancer awareness to the forefront. If you do it as individual, no, nah, no, nah, we can't have that because it's not making us any money. We're not getting enough uh, credit for it. We're not getting enough publicity for it. How dare you? How sickening is that? His mother lost her life to this god awful disease that you guys claim to back in a charitable effort to fight this disease. But when a man lost his mother, wants to pay tribute to her all season long, not harming anybody, not trying to go out there and be flashy, not trying to be individualistic, but to bring awareness to something that you guys want to bring awareness to as well, you say no to him. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely asinine. I I just, I don't get the NFL sometimes. I don't get their logic sometimes. I don't, I just don't think like that. I can understand you turning certain guys down because certain guys just want to be flashy. Certain guys just want to be out there and say, hey, look at me. That's what some guys want to do. But this wasn't about that. This was about something bigger than that. This was about life. And y'all said no. But I commend D'Angelo Williams because he was like, you know what? I pretty much knew they were going to say no. I knew they were going to say no. But he put a positive thing around it. He put a positive spin on it. He went, and I believe he paid. He paid for. Uh, he's paying for fifty-three um, examinations for women for breast cancer, uh, because fifty-three is the age at which he lost his mother to this horrible, horrible disease. So big ups, big credit to Jangel Williams for saying, you know what, I'm still going to go out there. I'm still going to still going to do something positive and something to. To tribute her. Hey, he died at the tips of his dreads pink and he painted his toenails pink. You know, he he did it in his own way without the NFL's help. So big ups to him for taking a negative and turning it into a positive. Losing a parent is difficult, I know. Losing a parent to this awful disease is even more difficult, I know, because I've gone through it myself. So big ups to him for making something positive out of something negative. Need more sports stories like that. Even though the NFL try to step there and block him. He still went out there and he's still doing something very, very positive for a lot of women and to tribute his to uh, as a tribute to his mother. And I know she's got to be damn proud of him. And I hope my pops is proud of me, too. This is Toss. All right, y'all, it's about that time for me to get on up out of here. I want to thank y'all for joining me on another edition of the Trishan on Sports Show. Man, we, we're doing big things, man. We're, we're starting to grow. A lot of people are liking that Facebook page and listening to our show. I want to thank each and every single one of you guys for tuning in each and every single Wednesday where we drop brand new episodes for you. I want to be that trusted voice for you guys, but I can't do it without your support. So make sure you go and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash T on Sports Show. That is T-O-N Sports Show. Also, check that page out for all of the links that you can see and hear our show on. We are on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. Again, the website is to Libsyn. That is L-I-B-S-Y-N.com. That is where you go and listen. That is the actual web page for the Toss, the Toss Show. Uh, you can go and listen to this week's episode and all of our other week's episodes. We're trying to build that library up for you. So whenever you need to go and work out, whenever you've got a long drive, you can just pop us in. You can just load us up and listen. Let us take you away with our banter, with our truthful, opinionated, and passionate sports talk. Because, again, I'm going to be that trusted voice for you guys. And the only way I'm going to do that is with all your love and all your support. In the meantime, I want to thank you all of you for all of it so far. 
we got a long way to go. We're going to keep learning. We're going to keep growing. We're going to keep getting bigger and better for you guys. I promise you that. And I thank y'all for all the love and for all the support. You have no idea how much it means to me. If I could put into words, I would, but I can't. That means y'all are doing something so special for me. So thank you guys so very much. But as I said before, it's time for me to get on up out of here. This is Tristan Thomas reminding all of you that dreams don't catch themselves. Get up, get out, and get after it. Until next week, so long from TOSS.